deadly crash. Debris of the missing plane found as all hope for survivors are lost. Stormy step down. Storm Elsa slowly reduces its roars while making its way towards Florida. Jab hesitancy. Vaccination reluctance rises as France makes a call in mandating the jabs. Sandy construction. Another Guinness World Record on one of the tallest stand structures in history. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from a devastating crash. A decades-old passenger plane carrying 28 people crashed in Russia's Far East, leaving everyone on board, including at least one child, feared dead. To give us an update on this, we have Other Than the World News special correspondent Malsa Padraja joining us now from Kursk in Russia. Malsa? Yes, Anuradi. Sadly, there are no survivors to be found in the crash. The Antono A26 twin engine turboprop was an entry from the regional capital Petropavlos Kamchatsky to Palana when it lost contact with air traffic control. It was reported that the plane was thought to have crashed into a cliff as it was preparing to land in poor visibility conditions. Russia's Civil Aviation Authority confirmed that the plane's crash site had been found after the emergency ministry dispatched a helicopter and, and had deployed teams on the ground to look for the missing aircraft. There were 22 passengers and 6 crew on board, the ministry said. The mayor of Palana was among the passengers. The weather in the area was cloudy at the time the plane, plane went missing. Russian aviation safety standards have improved in recent years, but accidents, especially involving aging planes in far-flung regions, are not uncommon. The Soviet-era plane type, still used for military and civilian flights in some countries, has been involved in dozens of deadly crashes since, since, since it entered civil service around 50 years ago. Back to you, Andrade. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News special correspondent Malta Padiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. President Biden's top advisor on Asia-Pacific issues has signaled that Biden could soon hold his first face-to-face -face summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping. The advisor says it could happen on the sidelines of the G20 summit later this year. Kirk Campbell, the White House Indo-Pacific coordinator, expects to see engagement between the leaders of the U.S. and China before too long, hinting that their first summit could take place at the G20 summit in October. His remarks come amid ongoing tensions between the two superpowers, which worsened under the Trump administration. Addressing the Asia Society think tank virtually on Tuesday, Campbell also said it's possible for Washington and Beijing to coexist peacefully, but it will be significantly more difficult going forward. He also described China as being increasingly assertive, taking on many countries simultaneously, which he said is in stark contrast with how it operated in the 1990s. Campbell also reaffirmed that President Biden will host a summit later this year with the leaders of the so-called Quad Group, Australia, India and Japan. The remark was shortly followed by a report by the Japanese daily Yomi Rishimbun, which confirmed the four countries have agreed to discuss ways to bolster technological cooperation, including semiconductors and AI. He added the ministers overseeing technology and science will sit down next Tuesday to discuss how the group can further expand the scope of cooperation from diplomacy and security to include technology as well. Campbell's comments also come as the Chinese government protested the U.S. decision to reject visa applications for some 500 Chinese students. Describing the move as a, quote, toxic legacy of the Trump administration, Beijing's state-run media said the students' applications had been rejected despite them all having offers for postgraduate study at top American universities. It added the rejections are based on Trump-era legislature, which prohibits the entry of Chinese students and researchers that the U.S. deems as being connected to China's military civil fusion strategy. We have some breaking news. According to a statement by Interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph, Haiti's President Jovenel Moyes has been killed in an attack on his private residence. Mr. Joseph said that the president's resident in Port-au-Prince was stormed by unidentified armed men at 1 o'clock local time. The first lady was reportedly also injured in the attack. 
Storm Elsa seems to have downgraded a bit, but Florida is still on alert as they brace themselves for heavy rain, winds and potential isolated tornadoes. Elsa weakened to a tropical storm early on Wednesday, just hours before it was expected to hit Florida's northern Gulf Coast. It had downgraded from a Category 1 hurricane. That's according to the U.S. National Hurricane Center, which added tornadoes were possible across Florida, Georgia and South Carolina. Strong winds and rain already flooded the streets of Key West Tuesday morning, a sign of what's to come. An NHC advisory said the center of Elsa was moving north, with max sustained winds of 75 miles per hour. The storm is expected to make landfall around Tampa Bay area late Wednesday morning, according to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. After, Elsa is forecast to move across the southeast through Thursday, dropping upwards of four inches of rain. It also threatens to impede the search and rescue effort at the condominium collapse site in Surfside, just outside of Miami. Crews have sifted through rubble for nearly two weeks in hopes of finding survivors. As of Tuesday, 36 people were confirmed dead and over 100 were still missing, according to the Miami-Dade mayor. Hong Kong police said that they had arrested nine people on suspicion of terrorist activities, consisting of six secondary students, a university management level employee and a secondary school teacher, and an unemployed person. A table of evidence was on display as Hong Kong police told a press conference they had arrested nine people on suspicion of terrorist activities. They are the latest to be targeted under a sweeping national security law, Beijing imposed on the financial hub last year. Among them were six high school students. The police say members of the group had deliberately recruited them. Those arrested also included a university management level employee and a secondary school teacher. It comes as Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam said on Tuesday ideologies posed risks to national security urging parents, teachers and religious leaders to observe the behaviour of teenagers and report those who break the law to the authorities. Officers also froze bank funds and seized an explosive chemical from a hostel room, police described as a laboratory for bomb-making equipment. TATP has been used in attacks by extremists in Israel and London. Beijing imposed the security law on Hong Kong last year, punishing what it regards as subversion, secession, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces, with up to life in jail. Authorities have repeatedly said it has restored stability. Afghan authorities deployed hundreds of commandos and pro-government militia to counter the Taliban's blistering offensive in the north that has seen more than 1,000 government troops flee into neighboring Tajikistan. Afghan government forces are prepared to launch a counter-offensive against the Taliban, according to a spokesman for the northern province of Takar on Monday. The Taliban attempted to seize Takar's capital city, Talakan, a day earlier. Violence has escalated in Afghanistan in recent weeks after U.S. President Joe Biden announced troops would withdraw unconditionally by early September on the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. On Monday, soldiers were seen guarding Talakan's western gate while armed civilians patrolled the streets. Hamed Mubarez is a spokesperson for Thakar's governor. The Taliban tried to break the city's defensive line and enter Talakwan's western gate. But they face strong resistance from our defense and security forces. Our forces were able to defend the western gate of the city with high morale and patriotism. The Taliban has seized most districts in the province in their attempt to reach the capital city. One government official from the neighboring Badakhshan province told the Taliban has also recently captured 26 of its 28 districts, which border Tajikistan and China. Tajikistan accepted over 1,000 Afghan military members fleeing violence over the weekend and bolstered their own border protections in anticipation of Taliban encroachment. Let's go in for a short commercial break. Stay tuned for more World News.
welcome back. Now on the updates on the Tokyo Olympics. The dream has come true. Athletes are arriving in Japan with all necessary actions taken to prevent the spread of COVID. To give us more details on this, other than a world news special correspondent, Rasita Chandradas, who joins us now from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita? Well, we first start with the only important Tokyo Metropolitan Government election results. The election was held on Sunday and the results were out by 8 p.m. And by midnight or past midnight, we knew pretty much the 100% of all results. And that was a very surprising one. Governor Koike Yuki's party, Tokyo First Party, which was expected to get a drubbing, had a very surprising good result. While the Suga, Prime Minister Suga Yoshide's Liberal Democrats had a very disappointing result, winning just 33 seats out of 127. So what this would mean? The Tokyo uh, voters have clearly rejected uh, Suga-san's policies over the Olympic. While the exit poll taken just after the election shows over 70% of the Tokyo voters prefer either a postponement, cancellation or Olympics without any spectators. To make matters worse, Sukasa's coalition partner, uh, the Kometo, who had a very good election, declares that they prefer an Olympic without any spectators. So this, the Tokyo election results put Prime Minister Suga Yoshida in a limbo and his next steps, steps are closely monitored. In the Olympic front, we had about nearly 1,000 athletes arriving in Japan in the past few days and there were a few uh, COVID positive cases. For example, a one of Serbian athletes was tested positive in the second COVID test and is in, is in self-isolation. So this would mean with around 68,000 athletes and officials expected to arrive, handling them would no means easy for the government and the organizing committee. The only important chairman, president of the IOC, Thomas Bach, is expected to arrive tomorrow. And no means his steps, his decisions are closely monitored. Whether it's a Tokyo Olympic sponsored by the Japanese government, this is in fact IOC's Olympics. So whatever steps he made, the decisions he made, are going to be what matters at the end. Thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan. France is in a heated debate over whether to require healthcare workers to get vaccinated for COVID-19. As the government deliberates, caregivers are reluctant to get vaccinated. Across the United States and much of Europe, governments are beginning to worry we've hit a vaccination ceiling. In recent weeks, the number of people making appointments to get vaccinated has dropped in several countries, leading authorities to consider their next move to ensure COVID doesn't make a vicious and deadly comeback. The French government is discussing the possibility of making vaccination mandatory for healthcare workers. The number of vaccinated caregivers in hospitals and retirement homes, for example, is too low to prevent another wave of COVID-19. Neighboring Italy made that decision months ago. The country passed a law obliging anyone working in public or private social health positions to get vaccinated against COVID-19 or be suspended without pay. And it's worked. Numbers suggest just 2.5% of Italian salaried healthcare workers have not yet received a single dose. In Russia, authorities have also taken drastic measures to fight a third wave of COVID-19. Last week, the city of Moscow rolled out an ambitious mandatory vaccination scheme requiring that all state and service sector workers be vaccinated against the virus. Over the weekend, Tajikistan became the first country in the world to make vaccination mandatory for all adults, but no details were given about how that mandate would be enforced. Indonesia is sourcing emergency oxygen for virus patients from neighboring Singapore and calling for help from other countries including China, with the archipelago slammed by its deadliest COVID-19 wave. Determined to help in any way that they can, these bikers have taken to escorting ambulances to clear a path for them in heavy traffic. This as Indonesia battles a record surge in coronavirus infections, with almost 30,000 new cases and over 500 deaths on Monday. Up to 200 people a day are being buried in this field, now a cemetery for the victims of coronavirus. 
The Red Cross warns the country is on the brink of catastrophe as hospitals are struggling to cope and have started treating patients in tents, while less than 10% of the country is fully vaccinated. People here queued for hours to fill up oxygen cylinders for their seriously ill family members amid a shortage. Over the weekend, dozens of patients died after the central supply of oxygen ran out at a hospital in Jogjakarta. The government announced that all domestic oxygen production will be reserved for medical use and it will also be importing supplies. To control the spread of the disease, Jakarta imposed a number of restrictions across over 20 provinces and has pledged to inject almost 11 billion euros extra in its fight against the virus. We have some good news for you. South Korean researchers have found that virtual reality can be used to activate the parts of the brain that process visual information and could help in the fight against dementia. Virtual reality technology could help prevent dementia. This patient has mild cognitive impairment. Through a program called Memory Walk, she is performing tasks directed by the screen. Researchers from Kachun University in South Korea conducted a study on 41 seniors aged 60 and older who had been hospitalized with mild cognitive impairment. Those who received VR-based cognitive training twice a week for one month showed a big jump in visuospatial function. Others who only received their regular treatment, like medication, showed a drop in this function. The visuospatial function of the brain is an important cognitive ability that allows people to process visual information and interpret where objects are. MRI scans showed that VR activated the parts of the brain related to memory and visual processing. The latest findings were published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Thousands of Peruvians took to the streets to protest uncertainty over the result of the presidential election a month ago as the confirmation of leftist Pedro Castillo is held up by ballot charges from his conservative rival. Aerial footage revealed widespread destruction of a British Columbia town ravaged by wildfire after it broke Canada's 80-plus year old heat record with a 49.6 temperature. Bollywood actors and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi paid tributes to one of the country's most respected actors known for his roles as a tragic hero in Bollywood films Dilip Kumar after he died. The leader of Australia's New South Wales ordered a week-long extension of Sydney's COVID-19 lockdown, warning new cases are bound to rise as the country's biggest city grapples with the highly infectious Delta variant. Rescuers in Japan waded through mud, rock and splintered wood in search of 24 people still missing after heavy rain triggered massive landslides in the seaside city of Atami killing at least four people. South Korea received 700,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine from Israel under a swap agreement, along with a separate shipment of 627,000 directly purchased doses. And finally tonight, at a height of 21.16 meters, 3.5 meters higher than the previous record holder, the world's new tallest sandcastle was unveiled in Denmark last week. The sandcastle, built in Blokhus in northwest Denmark, broke the Guinness World Record previously held by a sandcastle made in Germany in 2019, which was 17.66 meters. Dutch designer Wilfred Steiger said the corona pandemic had inspired the sandcastle. At the top of the castle, he put coronavirus bacteria as a crown to illustrate how the virus is ruling our world and not allowing us to do what we want to do. Like many other big sand castles, it is made as a triangle in order to not collapse and a wooden construction was erected around it so that the 30 artists could cut the figures in the sand. Around 4.8 tons of sand were used to build the sand castle. The sand is made up of 10% clay for it to stick better and when the sand castle is done, an extra layer of glue is put on to make it last through most of winter. The Guinness World Record measured by an authorised surveyor and signed by witnesses and will be in the book's next edition. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.